Creating a manga brings with itself many different challenges. You have to create interesting characters, worlds, themes, battle systems, the list goes on. But one thing that can sometimes be overlooked is just the importance of planning the script. And one fundamental question that always arises is, how do I keep my audience engaged every chapter? So what even makes a compelling manga chapter? Well, an obvious response would be that the chapter should progress the plot forward. But sometimes this just isn't enough, as if you don't captivate your readers early on in your story, they may drop your manga before ever reaching that pivotal moment you wanted to show them. So here lies a crucial problem. How do we create interesting opening chapters that grip our audience early on in our stories? And with so many successful manga to analyse that have overcome this problem, I don't think there's many that have captivated an audience as quickly in its first few opening chapters than the manga The Promised Neverland. And to fully deconstruct the techniques used early on in this manga, today we'll be specifically examining chapter 3, titled The Iron Lady. Excluding the amazing premise of The Promised Neverland's incredible plot, the amazing characters, Phil, You'll Always Be My Guy, and the incredible artwork, I'll be attempting to clearly analyse two main methods used in storytelling that propel the opening chapters to even greater heights, so that we could possibly implement them in our own stories. And these techniques aren't uniquely beholden to manga, but can also be used in all different works of fiction, such as novels and screenwriting. So with all that out the way, let's unravel The Promised Neverland's Chapter 3, The Iron Lady, to better understand on how to write a perfect chapter. To fully contextualise and understand Chapter 3 in better detail, we must first quickly recap the key plot points of Chapter 1 and 2. So, <laughs> if you could humour me, I'll do my best to quickly recap the first two chapters whilst also dropping minor hints to suggest the techniques being used throughout this manga. If you're already familiar with the story and want to skip this part, I've left timestamps below so that you can move on to the next section. Chapter 1 introduces us to the main protagonist, Emma, an orphan. Through the chapter, interchanging between her narration and dialogue, she expresses her love for the orphanage. The matron of the orphanage is only known as mother and Emma expresses that all the other orphans are considered to be her brothers and sisters. There underlined that though they're not biologically related, she considers everyone in the orphanage to be her family. We are introduced to a cast of characters and just through their importance of how they are positioned on the page, Norman and Ray. The beginning of the chapter instigates an unsettling George Orwellian tone. Though some aspects of the orphans' lives seem normal, the children have numbered tattoos on their necks and have to partake in daily difficult examinations, insinuating that something unsettling is happening at the orphanage. The beginning of this chapter introduces us to the normal life of the orphans, discusses the differences between Emma, Norman and Ray and divulges three main rules of their world. Number one, never go near the gate. Number two, never go past the fence surrounding the building. And number three, before you reach 12 years old, you will automatically leave the orphanage. The middle of the chapter sees a young girl named Connie gripping her toy rabbit as she sobs about leaving the orphanage as we're told she'll be given to a new family in the evening. Upon leaving, Emma realises that Connie has forgotten her toy bunny and with Ray deducing that they may still be by the gate, Emma and Norman attempt to reunite her with her bunny. This however, blatantly ignores a rule that was just established in their world. Never go near the gate. Then, boomage. With a truly unexpected moment, Connie lays dead in the back of a truck with a flower growing out of her stomach. And then, Emma and Norman witness the true nature of their world. That being that this world is in fact ruled by demons and that the orphanage is actually a farm with the children being kept as livestock to eventually be fed to them. Quivering under the truck, two main revelations are told to both the characters and us, the audience. 
The first being that Emma, Norman and Ray are considered to be the highest grade of meat from the farm and will be shipped out once they turn 12 years old. And the other revelation being that mother, their guardian, protector and parent is in fact working for the demons and has been lying to them their entire lives. The chapter concludes with them returning to the orphanage and Emma asking a question. How does she escape the orphanage safely with all her brothers and sisters without alerting mother and the demons? She answers it with one word. Tactics. With the end of chapter one, the tone and story has been set. This will be a harrowing survival story with the characters attempting to outwit their captors. We now have an incentive to read on. How will they escape? To briefly sum up chapter two, the important things to note are Emma's perspective of the orphanage has now changed from a once peaceful haven to a prison they must escape. Emma and Norman attempt to uncover the importance of their exams and deduce that if they're going to be eaten, why would they need to be educated? But an important fact is noted, that their scores correlate to when they are shipped away. They conclude that the next shipment of one of the children will be in two months, and the best time and place for them to escape will be in the daytime through the forest. Emma and Norman then ignore rule two, never go past the fence and venture past it only to witness a massive wall surrounding the entire orphanage. They then realize that to allow all the children to escape over the wall, they'll need to get their hands on some rope. The chapter ends with a chilling revelation that mother is able to track the children using a transmitter disguised as a watch. Emma and Norman consider this act of her openly using the transmitter in front of everyone as a declaration of war as she's openly communicating that she can track the whereabouts of everyone's location. Now that we've already established the context leading into chapter three, I'll try and do my best to demonstrate why I hold it in such high regard. A typical shonen chapter usually consists between 14 to 26 pages, and this chapter is no exception, with it being comprised of just 23 pages. I'm actually going to take out page 2 of this equation and ignore it as though it's a beautiful cover page, it has no relation to the chapter's story. So now we're just left with 22 pages, and laying them out in front of us, let's visually demonstrate the inevitable problem we discuss when constructing a manga chapter. It's universal knowledge that a manga chapter should always end on a cliffhanger, obviously forcing the audience to read on to find out what happens next. This is something we can't avoid and every manga has to do. However, this seems to be a catch-22, as if your entire chapter is just crafted of 21 pages of build-up, with the last page being the payoff, this will eventually become too predictable and stale for your audience and may allow them to lose interest before they can ever reach that climactic moment you've been working towards. This is something as a writer we need to solve. How can I make my chapters still interesting? And the answer to this is to try and keep your readers constantly stimulated through their entire read through of your chapter. And this is why The Promised Neverland is so effective, as it constantly keeps us on our toes by giving us shocking moments, revelations and wonderful expressive panel composition throughout its chapter. To properly highlight The Promised Neverland's formula, I'm going to refer to the white pages as the build up and the coloured pages as the payoff. I'll distinguish these payoffs into two separate categories. The blue pages are what I'll consider unexpected moments, and the red ones to be what I'll call revelations. And we can see that the promised Neverland is filled with these moments, as it constantly plays with our expectations and subverts them with some truly shocking pages. We can look at the layout and in this one chapter digress four pivotal moments within it. And it's not until I rearrange these pages that we can truly see the skill and rhythm of Curie's writing, as it only takes us six pages into the chapter to establish a new revelation to propel the story forward. So let's go line by line to examine the techniques being used and do a deep dive to see what we can learn from them. Page one begins with a quick recap of the previous chapter explaining that if they don't act soon, they'll be fed to the demons, with Emma and Norman glaring at Mother, uttering the words, she's a demon, an enemy. Page two again recaps their main objective that they only have two months to escape the orphanage. With just two pages, we've established their goal, the antagonist, and the consequences if they don't escape. 
This is something that the Promised Neverland excels at. With the nature of manga being weekly installments, it always reminds the reader of what happened in the last chapter, but doesn't become an annoyance through a big read through as it seemingly flows into the next chapter adding to the story's progression. Page 3 now continues the plot. Norman starts questioning what links their ages and their scores to their value. He slowly starts to unpack all the information they've gathered and ends the page stating, then the top of the line must be, and one effective way to make your audience turn the pages, <laughs> you can just leave the last sentence as a cliffhanger. I know something as simple as this can seem trivial, but it's actually a really effective way to end a page. And we can see this technique being used six times throughout the course of this chapter, highlighting that even though a rudimentary tactic, even professionals still implement it in their mangas. Pages 4 and 5 continue the dialogue between Emma and Norman, giving us some exposition of how the children are valued into their meat ranks, whilst also showing great characterization of the pair's deductive skills, still trying to answer that question. What links their scores to their shipments? Sieving through all the information, Norman finally answers the question with one expressionless panel. The size of our brains. And then page 6 hits us with our first revelation in chapter 3. The illustrator now uses Norman's expression of terror to reiterate this revelation. And with the second panel using images that can only be best used in the medium of manga and comics, explains that by the age of 12 their brains would have fully developed with the ending of the page finally answering the question. They're ranked on the size of their brains. The smarter you are, the later you'll be shipped away. In just six pages, the writer Kai Shirai has given us a vital piece of information, revealing the importance of why Emma, Norman and Ray are considered to be the top of the line meet. This revelation comes in the form of what I'll call the question and answer revelation. Remember, this is not only a question being asked between two characters, but it's also a question purposely directed towards us, the reader, prompting us to also try and figure out the answer, just like the characters, invoking not only an incentive to read on to find out this answer, but also inviting the reader to actively participate in the story. This revelation crucially rests on three important factors you need to consider. The first part is the easiest one to create. Is my initial question interesting enough to spark the reader's curiosity? Simple. The second factor is, have I, the writer, left enough hints throughout the story that the reader could figure out this question by themselves? Or by the very least, after this revelation, could my audience go back and find the hidden clues pointing towards this answer? Unfortunately, the third factor will heavily lean on the prior two. Even with a knee-jerking question and having enough clues sprinkled throughout your story, inevitably, it will all come down to this. Does the answer to the question feel earned? The answer to this question in the Promised Neverland's case is yes. Not only was it made obvious in Chapter 1 that Emma, Norman and Ray were the top students, therefore making them the smartest, but they were also clearly the oldest children in the orphanage, reinforcing this reason to why they were deemed the most valuable. But also, Curie left an innocuous small panel in chapter 1 that at first glance seemed unimportant, but now looking back with hindsight gave us another hint to how the children were ranked. In this small panel, we see young Connie deflated with her test results beside two young boys, who only got half of the answers correct. Disheartened, she states that for a while now she's been doing really badly in the exams, clearly highlighting towards the fact that she had been getting the worst scores in the orphanage inevitably causing her to be the next shipment out to the demons. With amazing planning, Curie has given both us the readers and the characters enough information previously to have this revelation feel earned. This is something as a writer you need to be aware of. To have a character ask a question in a manga automatically means that it has to be resolved. However, it's important to add where and when you choose to answer this is entirely up to you. For example, in one of my favourite mangas, Kingdom, in which I'd hopefully like to make a video essay on in the future, Rabuku, a general in the series, says he knows the weakness on how to defeat the deranged General Kanki in chapter 484. Many, <laughs> many years passed in my actual life, until now, 
In one of the most recent chapters, 724, this question was finally answered. Though I don't remember who General Ibuku was speaking to about Kanki's weakness, the fact of the matter is that this question always stuck in my head and lingered in my memory even through the most recent arcs. And this revelation itself now seems quite obvious, but before I really couldn't think of what General Kanki's weakness could be, as he always outsmarted his enemies in every battle. But once the answer was explained to me, it became apparent that the answer was always staring at me right in the face. Though there were many clues throughout the story of what Kanki's weakness was, when it was revealed it felt very satisfying and made the whole journey to finding out the more better for it. And this is why this method is so effective. It makes the reader become invested and take notice of moments in your stories that they'll carry with them into the future. And when the payoff is as satisfying as this, it also grants respect from the audience and makes them feel rewarded for reading your story. My point here is that you have the absolute freedom as a writer to create your own question and answer revelations and that the answer you present to the audience can either be answered in 300 chapters or three pages. However, the point of this method entirely rests on how curious the question is, how well prepared you've been in sprinkling hints throughout your story, and if the answer to the question feels satisfying and well earned. There have of course been many cases and shows when this method has landed flat on its face, due to one of these elements not being properly executed. Whether that being the initial question itself wasn't too interesting, or that the revelation itself wasn't very satisfying due to it either not feeling earned, or that the clues were so obvious that the final revelation felt inconsequential. So if you'd ever like to use this revelation and to avoid these mistakes, ask yourself these four questions. What would be a surprising revelation in my story that I could build towards? When should I have a character say a remark or ask a question hint into my audience about this revelation? How can I implement clues before or after this question, foreshadowing the answer without obviously answering it? And lastly, when is the best time to reveal this information to make it feel the most justified and well earned? With us better understanding the use of this type of revelation, let's now turn our attention to line 2, and to the next technique commonly used in manga, and my personal favourite, the unexpected moment. The first half of page 7 ushers in more context towards the previous reveal on the importance of their brains, whilst the second half redraws our attention to the important task of finding the rope. Pages 8-10 to 10 gives us more exposition that even though Mother can track them via the transmitter in her watch, the device doesn't specifically know who is being transmitted, meaning that Mother is suspicious of two children but still doesn't know their identity. This conversation leads into page 11, whereby Norman leaves Emma to go and fix a clock. Emma has a moment to breathe, and is reminded of Connie's death by the missing picture on the wall. She looks distressed, but ultimately prevails by thinking to herself, we have to find some rope. And then, Mother appears. This one panelled page must be one of the most chilling and impactful moments I've ever read in manga. I'll be honest with you, I actually wrote a paragraph on why I felt this entire page worked so well, until I stumbled upon something far more interesting, an idea. And instead of you just listening to my subjective take on this page, this idea is much more pragmatic and could even be used for reference or even implemented into your story. The idea is this, could you encompass the entire theme, tone and plot of your entire arc in just one image? Which, I'd argue, this image accomplishes. From the look in Mother's surveillant eyes, to a domineering presence, to the invasion of Emma's personal space, all conveys the main theme of imprisonment. The fear of having someone you love being the monster you must escape from, and the innocent small child frame being preyed upon, sets the harrowing tone of the story. And finally, with the disappearance of Connie's picture missing from the wall, explains the consequences of what will happen if Emma doesn't escape, therefore setting the plot of the story. They must escape this prison. Another interesting aspect of this page is not only the image itself, but how it is presented to us. And this is something I wanted to discuss when creating a chapter. Know when to use your panels for impact. 
As we can see, the three pages prior to this all collectively build up to this page. Page 9 only has 4 panels, page 10 has 6, and page 11 has 9. This increase of panels forces your eyes to move around the page more, so that when you're eventually faced with just one panel on the page, it creates an unexpected moment just within itself. As your eyes have gone from travelling across pages, to now suddenly being awkwardly still. As we're now just left with this unsettling image of a young girl who for the first time has laid eyes on the true terrifying face of her mother. And this perfectly sums up why I love the unexpected moment so much. Unlike revelations which need to feel earned, the unexpected moment doesn't. In fact it's in stark contrast. The reason that this moment is so effective is purely based on its shock value alone. No foreshadowing, no hints, no clues, just a moment that is supposed to create a visceral reaction from the audience. And this is the superpower of this technique. For all intents and purposes, it's supposed to be as surprising and dramatic as possible to squeeze as much tension as it can out of a scene. But just like every technique in this video, it does have one simple rule that it must adhere to. The unexpected moment has to make sense and abide by the rules you've already established in your world. And with so many different usages of the unexpected moment, I thought it'd be fun to quickly analyse some to see all the different types and attempt to see if they have anything in common. Firstly, of course, is the power-up. This moment comes in the form of seeing a new transformation, technique or skill that we haven't yet been shown in the series. This expands the world building and deepens the lore. You can either foreshadow a power-up to your audience or make it entirely unforeseen, but the unexpected moment itself is when you decide to show your power-up which can be truly effective in climactic situations. Another added bonus to the power-up is that the attack or transformation itself can be visually shocking to an audience's preemptive thoughts on what the power-up would look like. The moment of resilience. This would be when the audience believes that a character has reached their limit only for that character to push themselves further than we've ever seen them before, demonstrating some growth to a character's resilience and determination. The death of a character. This one is pretty self-explanatory, but to clarify a little, you can always foreshadow a death in a series, however the shocking moment would occur when you decide to kill that character off, to try and create the biggest emotional reaction you can in your story. Introducing a new lore to your series. This could come in many forms, with a character being newly introduced completely obliterating the already established power levels, introducing a new ability in the series, or simply just expanding from the world you've established. You can always create new lore in your story, as long as it has an explanation that feels cohesive to the world. The Plot Twist Everybody of course knows this one. This is when you've actively coached your audience in presuming a certain outcome only to change that outcome at the last moment. This, of course, could also be a question and answer revelation, as if you've asked a question hinting towards this plot twist, it would fall under this category. But it can also just as effectively come out of the blue with no warning at all. Both of these plot twists are just as valid as each other. The Surprise Introduction This introduction in definition would just be introducing a character unexpectedly into a scene to truly shock your audience and change the power struggle and momentum of that scene for either better or for worse. Which brings us back to this page. As I mentioned before, this has to be one of the most impactful moments I've ever read in manga, simply because <laughs> I just didn't see it coming. And with it being in chapter 3, made me even more excited to read the rest of the story as I wanted to find out what other swerve balls it would throw at me. And what I believe all of these unexpected moments have in common, is that they all become some of the most memorable parts of the series. Moments you never forget, 
and the reasons to why we read stories. So if you're like me and you have your own unexpected moments that you want to implement in your story, I hope I've at least conveyed that this moment is free and can be implemented into any part of your chapter in any form, just as long as it makes sense in the world you've established. Now that we've looked at the two main techniques you can use to incentivize people to read your story, for the last two lines we're going to combine an unexpected moment and a revelation together to see how this can ramp up the tension near the end of a chapter. Line three is the longest number of pages till the next big moment. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, we of course need to see the aftermath of the surprise introduction of Mother. This becomes at the core of the chapter's tension and is the first mental battle between our protagonist and antagonist. Mother scans and interrogates Emma to see if she is the culprit she's looking for, whilst Emma, terrified, must stay calm under the extreme pressure. Ray finally saves the day by alerting to everyone that it's dinner time, allowing Emma to escape the situation. Secondly, it allows the writer to play with our expectations as page 18 creates a sense of security and relief with Emma thinking to herself, thank God, we're safe. Which is why on page 19 when Mother asks, did you two go to the gate yesterday, creates another unexpected moment. Thinking about this, the writer didn't need to do this. The chapter would have still been impactful without it. However, Crucially, this unexpected moment achieves something different that we've yet to discuss, which is when creating any of these moments, another crucial aspect to recognize is character development. These two unexpected moments are not just used to create suspense, but also tell us something important about Mother's character. She is bold, and she is always in control. This moment was strategically added for this purpose greatly adding to Mother's threat level and therefore creating more tension in the story. We've established the writer constructs minor buildup and payoffs throughout the chapter and with the last three pages drops a massive revelation on its final page, enticing the reader to move on to the next chapter. This revelation of course follows the convention of being surprising and feeling earned. However, something we didn't touch upon too much is the primary function of the question and answer revelation. The main purpose in using this technique is to reveal new pieces of information to the audience whilst also progressing the plot forward. When we look at the previous revelation, it conveyed to us the importance of the orphan's brains, but in answering this question, move the plot forward by creating a new question. Why did the demons need to eat the orphan's brains? Likewise, this revelation that mother used to be an orphan directly moves the plot forward as it poses a new idea that there must be some cruel system at play that mother has to follow in order to survive. Not only creating even more depth to mother's character, but more importantly creates new lore in the world. And this is something that truly shocked me about this manga. I always felt like it had shown me its full hand, but it constantly kept drip feeding me more and more information. I think maybe a less experienced writer would have revealed this information at the end of the arc as a plot twist. But no, we're told this information in chapter 3, which creates more engagement and inquiries from the audience. I think this attitude of revealing more information earlier on in your story is perfectly explained in an interview on Film Courage with screenwriter Shannon E. Johnson. She discusses... When you're thinking about television, so a lot of the times people will, you know, have a pilot and now they're thinking of, uh, you know, the, the next couple of episodes and they're like, oh my God, I'm really going to get you at, at episode five. I've got to wait five episodes before I'm invested? <laughs> no one's going to do that. If you can't catch me at the pilot, I don't mean as an audience, I mean like as the executives, as the people you're pitching to. The pilot is what sells the series. If you're telling me that you, you're gonna go into this pitch meeting and you're gonna say to them, wait till we get to episode five, then that sounds like episode five should be the pilot. <laughs> you know, like you gotta get me in here. And, and because it's 2020, I could be doing this <laughs> while I'm watching, you know, I could be doing all kinds of things. And this may all seem counterintuitive, but don't be guarded or afraid to drop important information that you would have otherwise shared later on in your story. Remember, 
Our main objective for our opening chapters is just to strengthen the audience intrigue and curiosity so that they hopefully progress further and further into the story. By the end of the chapter, we can see by using an unexpected moment along with revealing information, ramps up the excitement and adds more tantalizing questions for the audience to discover. What's behind the door? Is the rope in there? What's mother's backstory? How does she become the head of the orphanage? Will mother find out the identities of Emma and Norman? And most importantly, will they escape the orphanage? Finally, to wrap this entire chapter in a nice little bow, this last edition is something you could add to your chapter, but isn't necessary. It's just something I see mangas do ever so often, and that is tying a thematic question to just one chapter. Looking at the first line of the chapter with Emma narrating, I believe that Mama was just like us, a human, and Norman stating, she's neither our mother nor a human, sets a thematic tone throughout the chapter, asking the question, is mother human? And with the chapter exploring this question, we're led to believe that, <laughs> no, mother isn't human. She's a deranged, feelingless monster who feeds children to demons. And everything up until the last page suggests this. But with the first page juxtaposed with the final page's revelation, with mother showing us the tattoo on her neck, inevitably humanizes her and suggests that she was once an innocent orphan like Emma, adding another layer of nuance to Emma and Norman's thoughts towards mother being just pure evil. Instead, this reveal hints that mother is human just like Emma, someone who is also struggling to survive and that this harsh world has turned into a monster, unfortunately creating the Iron Lady. With so many old and new mangas out in the world, not to mention the bundle of streaming services with amazing TV shows and animes, there has never been a time before in human history where there has been so much content vying for your attention. So I want you, someone who's watching this video, to pick one of your favourite series. This could be a manga, TV show or an anime and just think all the way back to when you first started consuming it and try to remember that one moment when you realised, okay, this is cool, I like this, now I'm going to give it my full attention not knowing that this was about to be one of your new favourite things. For my example, I'm going to use a TV show that I've recently rewatched and have thoroughly enjoyed, which, <laughs> if you've noticed from the style of this video, you can probably figure out that this show is Stranger Things. I heard a lot of great things about the show, but I'm one of those people that if someone tells me to watch something, I just don't watch it until the hype train has left. So, one weekend when season 2 had just dropped back in 2017, I decided to sit down and watch the show. I remember watching the first episode of season 1 and was still trying to figure out why people liked it so much. It wasn't until the ending of episode 2 when Barb died, rest in peace Barb, I'll never forget you, that I then had that moment. And what I mean by that moment is, I went from someone who was just a casual viewer to, holy shit, okay, I'm in, and disgustingly finished both seasons that weekend. Am I proud of myself? No. But my point here is that moment, that scene that made me go from a casual viewer to a fan. From someone who was half watching the show on my phone to someone who binged both seasons and afterwards would speak to people about the series and most importantly, recommend it to those who hadn't. And this is what I mean by a perfect chapter or for this analogy, a perfect episode. I'm not stating that the episode itself was perfect but instead that this was the episode that made me pay attention and finish the two seasons. Therefore, in all intents and purposes, regardless of its quality, had the most desired effect on myself, which was, I became so invested in the story that I had to see what happened next until I finished the show. This was the exact same response I had when I was reading The Promised Neverland. The first two chapters were interesting, but it wasn't until I read this page on chapter 3 that I really paid attention and became invested in the story. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, this manga is not perfect, and there were some arcs that I felt were overly bloated. 
but the fact is I stayed loyal to the series and finished it all because of how the opening chapters and arc made me feel. And if there's anything I want people to take away from this video is that creating more moments in your opening chapters, whether using unexpected moments or question and answer revelations, the more chances you have in turning someone from a casual reader to a fan. Of course, this manga also has the incredible artwork, the amazing characters and the intriguing setting that are all just integral to why this manga was so successful. But like I said, with so much competition nowadays vying for people's attention, these techniques could really increase the viewership of your story, whilst also creating a guide on how to write a perfect chapter. If you've made it this far in the video, I owe you a bit. So thank you so much for taking the time to watch it. Honestly, I was really shocked at the response from my last video and the comments left below were really, really humbling. I promise my next video won't take as long to make, but this video just kept snowballing into some really interesting areas that have actually really helped my own writing. And I'm still improving my video editing, so that's why they may take a little longer to come out. But I want to try and create the best videos for anyone that's watching. If you have any suggestions for manga to cover or any specific writing problems you're personally having, please hit me up in the comments below. I have lots and lots of video ideas that I'm working on and I'll try to get them out as soon as possible. So if you guys want to look out for those, please if you don't mind, like the video and subscribe to the channel. And with all that said everyone, have the dopest of days.